Welcome to Free Christian Church of God's video outreach ministry, bringing the gospel message of Jesus Christ into your home each and every Sunday morning. If you would like more information about the video ministry or other ministries that we have to offer, stay tuned immediately following this program. And now, open your Bibles and follow along as we bring you today's message. Take your Bible this morning, turn to John chapter 6. John chapter 6, when you get there, stand to your feet. I want to remind you, a week from today, we're going to take a special offering to purchase the new cameras for the church. I'm sure Steve talked about it in the announcements, but I know how church people are in announcements. We hear somebody talking, but it doesn't really register necessarily what they're saying. Next Sunday, we want to raise $12,000 to buy new cameras for our video ministry. Uh, it is a major, major outreach to this church. You know that there are more people that watch this service outside of this building than do inside of this building. I don't think you quite grasp that. I don't think you quite grasp how many thousands of people are hearing the gospel because of this church's heart to reach outside of its doors. You know, I, you know, I, I read a story the other day. The preacher was trying to raise money for something. He said, I got good news, and he said, I got bad news. He said, I got the good news is we have all of the money we need for the project. The bad news is it's still in your pocket. <laughs> but I believe that God is going to take care of that if we do what he asks us to do. It's one thing to say that I'm supporting it and I'm behind it and I'm in favor of it, but it's quite another to help make it possible. And I want you to pray about it this week. Don't do anything God doesn't tell you to do, but whatever he tells you to do, you need to do it. You need to do it because we need to get this done. It is a need in the church. It is a need for outreach. There's somebody out there that's going to get saved because of what this church is doing, and that is what is awesome. Someday you're going to step into heaven. Somebody's going to come over to you and say, I want to thank you. I'm here today because of what your church did, and you've been a part of that. John chapter 6. Before we read it, lift your Bible in your hair. Say it with me. This is my Bible. It's God's infallible word. I am who it says I am. I have what it says I have, and I can do what it says I can do. Today I'll be taught the word of God. I'm about to receive the incorruptible, indestructible, ever-living seed of the word of God. My mind is alert, my heart is receptive, and I'll never be the same in Jesus' name. John chapter 6, verse 1. Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee. And a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the miraculous signs he had performed on the sick. Then Jesus went up on a mountainside and he sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover feast was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him because he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, Eight months' wages would not buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another of the disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. He said, Here's a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will they go among so many? Jesus said, Have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, and the men sat down, about 5,000 of them. And then Jesus took the loaves, and he gave thanks, and he distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they had all eaten enough to eat, he said to his disciples, Gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. God, I ask for your anointing to be over your word right now. Father, there's some things that we need to know and some things that we need to hear. And Father, I pray that you will give to us not just what we want or what we think we need, but God, give to us what we truly need. God, we're here to hear from you today. We have worshiped you and praised you. God, now we want to hear from you. And God, speak to our hearts. Speak to our life. God, practical things that we need as people in this world, God, to survive, to succeed. God, to, to honor you in the way that you made us and put us on this earth to do. Father, anoint your word in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. 
The account that we've read here in John 6 is one of the few Bible stories that appears in all four of the Gospels. Whether you know it or not, it's the only miracle of Jesus that's recorded in all four Gospels. We find this account also in Matthew chapter 14, Mark chapter 6, and Luke chapter 9. That tells me a couple of things. <coughs> First of all, it was an event that stood out in the experiences of all four Gospel writers. All four of them were there. They saw what had happened. They were amazed at this awesome miracle that Jesus had performed, and they wanted everybody to know about it. When God does good, tell somebody. When God does good, tell somebody. We're quick to complain. We find it easy to grumble or growl when things don't go our way. We turn on God almost instantly when we're not pleased with what he's doing. But when God does good, it's usually just a quick, thank you, Jesus, and we're on our way. But God wants to be praised. God wants to be praised. One of the very foremost things he ever put you on this earth to do was to praise him and to worship him and honor him as God. He made you and put you here not to make you happy, but to make him happy. Roger Bennett was a a piano player for the Cathedral Quartet. He had gotten leukemia. He got sick for a while, and then it went into remission, and then when it came back on him, it came with a vengeance. And finally, in 2007, he passed away after an 11-year battle. Bennett said that, he said, I'm convinced that our enemy stalks us exactly the way the Bible describes it, like a roaring lion. He hides in the bushes waiting for any sign of weakness, and then he strikes said his faith had become weak in the loneliness that was associated with the bone marrow transplant he was going through. And he said one, one particular night, he said he just bottomed out. He said, the devil didn't strike me physically. The, the, he, that had been accomplished by the chemo. He said, but he struck the more critical part of my being. He struck my joy and my confidence and my hope. Every thought, he said, I, I turned toward heaven, bounced back to me as though it were made of brass. He said, every time I tried to look on the bright side, I ended up imagining a very dark future. And then he threw his most effective dart at me. He said, the devil threw the dart of doubt. He said, you call yourself a Christian. What a hypocrite. You wrote songs like, don't be afraid, and yet you're more afraid now than you've ever been. You've written about joy, and yet now you're filled with despair. Use so much for your faith, Mr. Gospel Singer. He said, I hit rock bottom. I believed everything that Satan was telling me. He said, I tried everything that I knew of to pull out of it. He said, I I thought if I could just doze off for a while, maybe by morning it would pass. But he said, the clock moved slow. I tried to read my Bible, but my eyes blurred to what I was trying to see. He said, then I had an epiphany. I began to think about the story and acts of uh, Paul and Silas and when they were in jail. He said, they didn't despair they sang it became their weapon so he said i begin to sing that night all by himself in an isolated hospital room he said one hymn after another old songs came to my memory he said i sang them and i to this empty room he said it wasn't a great performance but it may have been the most powerful blessing i've ever received in my life god inhabits the praise of his people god is moved and motivated by praise it does his divine ego good when he hears you and me praise him for who he is and because of the great things that he does the bible says in psalm 22 3 that god inhabits the praises of his people That means that it is our worship of him that draws him to us. It's when we honor him that he comes near us. And when he is near us, it's when our enemy flees and the things around us begin to change. Maybe nothing's happening in your life at this moment because you refuse to give God the glory that he seeks from you. Second of all, this story stands out in all four of the Gospels because it was an event that God wanted you and me to know about. When God speaks, he shouldn't have to repeat himself to get our attention. But when God says something four times, when God has emphasized it, we better get it. We better get it. But before he tells us this account of this miracle, John says in the very first verse, if you've got a King James Version, he says, after these things. 
after these things. John's telling us that there has been a prelude written to the story that we are about to discover, and it's important that we know what that is so that we can better understand what he's about to tell us. Every word in the Bible is important. So he says, after these things. So what things was John referring to? You have to go back a chapter. In chapter 5, we read that Jesus was in Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. And he just happened to be passing by the pool of Bethesda. No, the truth is, he was there on purpose. Always remember, God never goes anywhere without a purpose. Bethesda is from the Hebrew in the Aramaic word that had a double meaning. Bethesda is interpreted as house of mercy because of those that were healed there. But it also means shame or disgrace because of the many crippled people who gathered there. The pool of Bethesda was known for the healing of the sick and the disease. The Bible says that at a, a certain season, an angel would come down out of heaven and he would stir the pool. And once the waters of the pool of Bethesda were stirred, that the first person into the water would be healed of their infirmity. As Jesus passed by that pool that day, he met a man who was lame. He'd been lame for 38 years. He had been lame for a lifetime. He had a lifetime of trouble. He had a lifetime of dealing with a handicap. A lifetime of struggling through every day. He had a lifetime of not having a normal lifetime. Some of you have had a lifetime of trouble. You don't know what it is to start a day without a mess. You don't know how it would feel to start your day without pain or without heartache. You don't have the same pleasures as the people do around you. You've never had the same opportunities. While things go right for the people, other people, they always seem to go wrong for you. You've had a lifetime of trouble. Maybe it hasn't always been the same problem. Maybe it's been a new problem every time. But you've dealt with sickness, and you have dealt with poverty, and you've dealt with family troubles, and you've dealt with death. You don't understand why it keeps happening to you. You think your turn ought to be over. Maybe it ought to be somebody else's turn now. You might even be getting to the place where you think that God doesn't really love you. After all, if he did love you, why would he allow these things to keep happening over and over in your life? There have been people around you who have had the same troubles as you, but their problems seem to get fixed. But yours never does. It's just one thing after another. An ongoing struggle, a lifetime of trouble. You need to hear this story. Over the course of the 38 years of this man's life, he had spent much of his time waiting by the pool. That tells me that nothing else worked. You figure if you get to the place where you spend every waking moment of your day by a pool, waiting for the water to get stirred so that you can be the first one in and be healed, you pretty well spent your other opportunities. You've tried everything else, they didn't work. But he spent much of his life waiting by the pool. He spent most of his days hoping for a chance, seeking the miracle that would set him free from this handicap. He needed a miracle that would set him free from a life of begging, a life of poverty. But because he was crippled, he couldn't get into the water by himself. Now listen to this. He was so close. He was so close and yet so far. He knew what he needed and he knew where he needed to go, but he couldn't do it by himself. He needed someone else to help him get to the place where he could be set free from his troubles, but nobody helped him. They all told him that they would pray for him. They all gave him a dollar every now and then. They all saw him. They all knew of his situation. They all felt sorry for him. But nobody did anything to change his situation. Are you following me? <clears throat> what can you do to help somebody? What can you do to make a major difference in the life of someone who's had a lifetime of trouble? James says faith without works is dead. And there's a lot of dead faith in the churches today. Who have you been walking by that needs your assistance? I wonder, where was the church in all of this? Where were the scribes and the Pharisees? Where was the leadership of God's church? Where were the compassionate and the caring? Where were the godly and the Christ-like? Shouldn't somebody have been there every day to help those who needed it into the water? Jesus said, do you want to be made whole? I thought that sounded like a cruel and insensitive question. 38 years he spent like this, and Jesus said to him, Do you want to be made whole? But Jesus wanted those who were with him to hear this man's answer. 
That's why he asked the question. And the man looked up to him and he said sadly, I have no man. I have no man. There was no one there to help him. He could only watch as other people would come and get healed in front of him. He could only watch as those who weren't as bad off as he was would step into the water ahead of him and be cured. He said, while I'm making my way to the pool, somebody always steps in front of me. Survival, self-preservation are selfish. Sometimes it brings out the worst in people. You would have thought that after 38 years, somebody would have made a way for him and allowed him to go first. But everybody was busy taking care of number one. Everybody was busy taking care of themselves. If it would have been today, I could imagine people going, you know, if you need some help, call me. Yeah, he had plenty of time to do that and then get in the water. Christian, what do you have that could help somebody else? What do you have the ability to do that would assist someone who can't do it for themselves? What are you using as a luxury that could be somebody else's necessity? Somebody suggested to me the other day, he said, you know, gold $1,600 an ounce. He said, why don't we just tell people to bring in the gold stuff they don't wear anymore? You know, I got thinking about that. 500 ounces of gold, we'd be building a building. You got an old necklace, an old bracelet, an old ring. We all have stuff. What do you have that's a luxury to you that, that could help somebody else? Jesus said to the lame man, rise, take up your bed and walk. And the Bible says that instantly he felt new life coming into his limbs. Instantly he felt new strength and he felt into his muscles and his joints. And immediately he did something that he had done for 38 years. He stood up and he walked. Praise God. He stood up and he walked. Church, what are we doing for the lame in our community? What are we doing for those who have been crippled by the circumstances of life? Those who are destined to lie and rot away in the doldrums of despair because nobody wants to help? What are we doing for those who have no man? What are we doing for those who desperately need a, the miracle working of power of God to set them free? Where's our compassion? Where is our caring? Where is our ministry? There are those who are desperate for the touch of God, but they have no one to bring them to Him. They have no one to carry them here. They have no man. But Jesus healed him. Jesus healed him, and the Bible says that immediately he was made whole, and he took up his bed, and he walked. Now, that would be a great thing, right? Then one of the Jews, who was critical of Jesus' ministry, saw the man carrying his bed on this Sabbath day, and he said, you know, it's against the law for him to carry his bed on the Sabbath. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? One thing that I find offensive is somebody quoting the law who don't know the law. There was a lawsuit in Defiance County a few years back that was filed by the ACLU and a professor from the Defiance College to get a picture of Jesus taken down out of the county courthouse. You remember that? You remember that? Some people just need to get a life. Don't they? They need to get a life. Their argument was the separation of church and state. We've all heard that. And they claim that the First Amendment prohibits such things. I want to read to you the First Amendment. It says, Congress shall make no law. Now, I'm going to wait there till you grab that. Congress shall make no law. Has Congress met, made any laws about this thing? But it says it shall make no law restricting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or bridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people to peaceably assemble and to petition the government for redress of grievances. According to the Constitution, the government does not have the authority to mandate religion or the authority to prohibit the free exercise of religion. But because most Americans have no idea what the Constitution says, they believe the lies that are being told to them. If you got a politician saying to it, vote him out of office. He's a liar. Don't quote the Constitution unless you know the Constitution, and don't quote the law unless you know the law. The Jews were trying to quote the law and to use the law against the one who had written the law. They evidently weren't bright enough to realize that it was his voice that had spoken out of the burning bush. It was his finger that reached out of heaven and inscribed it in the tables of stone. It was his hand that hewed out the stone tables and laid them at Moses' feet. Don't be quoting the law to the lawmaker. 
The scripture goes on to say that for this, the Jews sought to kill Jesus. How warped is that line of thought? Because Jesus had healed a man who had been lame for 38 years because he helped somebody that they had ignored for 38 years and because that man was now able to do things he had never been able to do in his lifetime, they wanted to kill Jesus. That is the prelude. That is what brings us to this text. Jesus had done one great thing for one single man and it angered the devil's crowd to the place where they wanted to kill him. So in response to their attack, what did Jesus do? He decided that he was going to help 20,000 people. You want to freak the devil out when he attacks you for doing one good thing? Go out and do 20,000 more good things for God. He'll start letting you alone. So after these things, now that makes a whole lot more sense, doesn't it? That little phrase right there had a whole lot in it. After these things, Jesus boarded a ship. He crossed the Sea of Galilee. But the Bible says a great multitude of people followed him. How many? According to the gospel account, there were 5,000 men plus women and children. Now, if families back then were like families are now, that means 10, 15, 20,000 people or more. The Sea of Galilee is 13 miles long, 6 miles wide. Top that off with 15 to 20,000 people sailing across it or walking around it. It's easy to see this, this was quickly becoming a big deal. It was getting out of hand. The presence of God is magnetic. He is attractive. He's appealing. And, and where you find his presence, you'll also find men and women and boys and girls clamoring to be near him. So what is the formula? The Bible says you praise him and God will show up. God shows up and people will come. That sounds pretty easy, doesn't it? Verse 2 says they followed him because they saw his miracles. People don't come to church for its programs. They don't come to the church for its appearance. They don't even come for its music. They come for its power. They come for its power. We live in a world that asks the question, what can you do for me? What can you do for me? What can you do for me that nobody else can do? What can you offer that I can't find anywhere else? What can you give to me that I can't get on my own? And that's where the church comes in. That's where we come in. We are to be the manufacturer of the miraculous, the establishment of the astounding, the architects of the awesome, and the engineers of the extraordinary. We are to offer to this world the things that they can't find anywhere else. And when the church doesn't offer the miraculous, we're not being the church. We're not being the church. Those who are sick and dying, those who the doctors have given up hope on, need to be able to find hope in the church. I don't know what it would be like to walk through the valley of the shadow of death and not have a church family around me that loves me and that cares for me, that's praying for me and is helping me through. Those who are beaten and battered need to find peace and comfort in the sanctuary of the church. Those who are burdened and buried in prison and poverty need to be able to find prosperity and release. Those who are burdened need to be able to find relief. Those who are captive need to find freedom and those who are under attack need to find protection if they can't find those things here in the church then the church is not being the church they follow jesus because of his miracles but the miracles that attracted them to jesus put them in a position for something more important and they didn't even know it it put them into a position where jesus can now preach them the gospel we do things around here to get people here to get them here. There is nothing, I've looked it up, there is nothing in the Bible about barbecue chicken. <laughs> I have looked. There's nothing in the Bible about having a football Sunday. There's nothing in, in the Bible ab about going crazy at Bible school. But if you get people here, then you can preach to them. Just give me a chance. And they can hear the gospel. That's what Jesus was doing. That's why he was healing the sick. He was more concerned about eternal life than temporary life. Then in verse 5 it says, When Jesus lifted up his eyes and he saw the great multitude of people, he said to Philip, Philip, where shall we find bread that these may eat? Can you imagine me turning to one of my staff members, one of the elders of the church, 5,000, 20,000 people you know, out here going, okay, we've got to feed these people. We're going to get something for them to eat. Who would I, who, who would I turn to? Who, who, not you guys. You're way too skinny. Who would, who would I turn to? Philip evidently was from this area, and if anybody would have known a source for food, Philip would have. I mean, if there was a Walmart or a Kroger or a Chief nearby, Philip probably would have knew where it was. Jesus said, where can we buy bread? Did you catch that? Where can we buy bread? 
What a tremendous example Jesus sets forth to the church here. Our responsibility is not to take from our community. It is our job to give to our community. That's why when the local community needed a place to play soccer and to play baseball and to play football, we invited them out to use our land. We did the mowing. We did the maintenance. We didn't charge them a dime. That's why when the local school needed to have a place for band camp, we brought them out here, turned on the air conditioning, opened up the kitchen, didn't charge them a dime. That's why we feed the town for free every fall and why we set up games for the kids and furnish the prizes at our expense at the local festival. That's the church being the church. The outside world often views the church as the local charity, a place of fundraisers and dinners and socials, a place that asks for their money, a place that needs their financial support to do its job. The church has projected an image that, to the local community uh, uh, like a pauper with his hand out and his pockets turned inside out, begging for help. But that's not God's church. That's not God's church. Listen to me. The church is the rich place. Oh, wow, that was quiet. The church is the rich place. It is the repository of wealth and the storehouse of the tithe. But because God's people don't give like God's people are supposed to give, because they rob God of their tithes and they rob God of their offerings, because people have become more self-centered than they are God-centered, the church has been forced into a subordinate role. Jesus said, where can we buy bread? But I want you to hear how this works. Now, 20,000 people to feed, and Jesus wants to pick up the tab. I was raised right. I was raised right. My dad, when we went out to eat, it didn't matter if my dad was working or on retirement and Social Security. My dad would grab the bill, and he would pay. When I got to be a man, I got to be old enough, I began to figure it out. And I started racing my dad for the bill because I understood that. You know, a lot of people sit back home, oh, yeah, it's going to be a free one. I'll just order the steak because we're selfish and self-centered. But my dad taught me right. As my dad got older and, and, and he couldn't remember things well, when I would take him to the doctor, I would always slip a, a 10 or a $20 bill into his pocket. It was the only thing in his pockets. And I would take him, he wanted to go to the fish place, and we would go to Captain D's. And we go into the fish place, and I said, are you buying? Yeah, I'll buy. And he reached in his pocket, and there would be that bill. And he'd take it out, and he'd lay it on the counter. <laughs> because my dad wanted to pay. My dad wanted to pay. How many of you want to pay? How many of you want to pay? Or how many of you just tightwads looking for somebody to take you out for lunch? <laughs> you need to get a little God in you and get a little bit of the devil out of you. The question forced the disciples to evaluate their priorities. It forced them to go to put a price on their ministry. It forced them to consider the cost of the gospel. And Philip answered, 200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them that everyone would take a little bite. A penny was the Hebrew equivalent of the Roman denarius, which was worth about 16 cents. So 200 penny worth would be about $32. Evidently, that was the entire budget of the disciples. As a pastor, I can honestly tell you that all too often a church budget gets in the way of ministry. We look at the checkbook and we tell God what he can afford to do. We look at the Sunday morning offering and we set limitations on our ministry. We study our past incomes and predict how long it's going to take to pay things off. I've got some news for you. God is not limited by the church budget. God's not limited by the church budget. He won't be held back by what we don't have. He can't be stopped by an accountant, bound by a bookkeeper, or stalled by an auditor. Jesus fed the multitude with five barley loaves and two small fish given by somebody who believed that little is much when God is in it. It was given by somebody who believed that their God was big enough to do something miraculous with it, and he never even touched the disciples' bank account. Do you hear me? Because somebody stood up and said, I'll do this. God blessed that so he didn't even need their $32. Verse 8, Andrew said to Jesus, There's a lad here, he has five barley loaves and two small fish, but what are they among so many people? Have you ever tried to talk somebody out of their lunch? I got to tell this. Where are you, Jerry? Where are you, Jerry? He's hiding. Down behind the pew. Look, 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 crawling. We, 
Some of you wonderful church people, we, we went to Myrtle Beach for a few days, some guys from a church. There were 15 guys all together between our church and my brother's church. And, and we went to a place recommended by some of you wonderful church people. You know, I have these church people come at me, so you go to Myrtle Beach, there's a place you have to eat. You know, you have to go there. And, you know, Dave tells me about it. And, of course, I'm looking at Dave. He said, you know, I don't know if Dave recommends. I really want to listen. Uh, but, <laughs> but they all recommend it. And I don't want to offend anybody. I don't want to make these people mad, so I'm going to check it out. We went to a place called Rio's. It's a steakhouse in which they, it, it's filet mignon. And if that ain't good enough for you, they'll have filet mignon wrapped in bacon. <laughs> oh, yeah, whoever thought of that? That's right up there with the Reese cup, peanut butter and chocolate. <laughs> yeah, that. <clears throat> Cow's good, but if we wrap it in a pig, it's better, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Lamb chop, you name it. They have a little card they put on your table. And, and I didn't know how this worked. They give you the card, and they said, you go to the salad bar first. <laughs> right. Uh, you, <laughs> you go to the salad bar first, and then when you're done with all that, you turn it over, and green means go. That means the people with the meat will start coming to your table. Me and Jimmy looked at each other and going, we ain't going to the salad bar. We turn that thing over. <laughs> we had five pieces of meat before the guys got back from the salad bar. Jerry come back he said across from me which was not good for either one of us and he's looking at the meat I got on my plate and he's looking at the lettuce on his <laughs> it didn't take him long that that plate just kept moving further and further and further and for finally it ended up in the middle of the table and he went green <laughs> and I'll tell you me and Jerry was so polite we didn't want to offend any of the waiters every time they come by I said would you like one of these well no all right yeah <laughs> I like them pig-wrapped you know, tenderloins, and, and, and Jerry had two. I didn't have any. <laughs> you think I could talk him out of one of those? <laughs> you, you really think I could talk? You live with him. You know I couldn't have talked him out of that. You can't. You ever try to talk somebody out of their lunch? There must have been something special about Andrew. Can you just picture him walking through all these thousands of people looking for food? <laughs> What's in the bag? You have something in that bag? You, you chew, I think I saw you chewing. What are you, what are you chewing? You, and, you know, trying to, out of fifteen to 20,000 people, only one small boy had a lunch. Do you believe that? Do you buy that? Out of 20,000 people, only one little kid had a lunch with him. I don't believe it. Where there are people, there is also food. I'll bet if I come out there right now, Quick, put your Cheerios away. <laughs> you ought to have food. Where there's people, there's food. I just know there's probably a couple dozen ladies out there hiding a Hershey bar or something, a Snickers, a fat dude sub tucked up under his arm, you know. Some mother with a Tupperware bowl full of Cheerios. I don't know what they had back then. Out of 20,000 people, somebody had to have some food, but only one small boy volunteered what he had. Quite often, our children have a better handle on being Christ-like than we adults. Kids are real quick to want to give somebody something, to want to give somebody something. I, I brought Ariana home some stuff from Myrtle Beach, just junk. Kids like junk, you know, a little flashlight thing and some candy and, and all that, and everything in a bag. And I said to her, I said, man, I said, I said, you really got some neat stuff in there, don't you, boy? She said, yeah, I do, and why did you call me boy? <laughs> <laughs> but yesterday... Yesterday, she was going over to Aislinn's house, and she said, I'm going to give Aislinn one of these lights. I said, well, I got that for you. She said, but Aislinn doesn't have one. I'm going to give her one. A lot of times, our kids have a better handle on being Christ-like than we do. This little boy volunteered his lunch, but Andrew said, what is it so among, among so many? Sometimes, we just refuse to understand that little is much when God's in it. Verse 10, Jesus said, make the men sit down. There's a divine order in the church, and God will only pour out his blessing when that order is followed. The church is not a democracy. Some people are offended when they don't go get a vote on certain issues or they don't get a vote on certain positions in the church. They feel like the church is a, is a government and it should be governed by a majority rule. But the fact is the church is not a democracy. The church is a theocracy. God is the head of the church. Christ is his shepherd and the pastor is his under shepherd. It's not of the people, by the people, and for the people. It's of God, by God, and for the kingdom of God. 
And God said the men had to sit down. That's the structure. That's the order that works. The Bible says in the Gospel of Mark that the men sat down in ranks of 50 and 100. And when Jesus had given thanks, when he had given thanks, he passed it out to all the people. After he prayed over it, he distributed it to the disciples. Notice the order. Jesus prayed, he gave it to the disciples, and then the disciples distributed it to those who were sit down. Now, if they stood up, they didn't get any. If they got out of line, they didn't get any. If they tried another format or another structure, another approach, if they were selfish and they jumped in line and tried to get in in front of other people, they didn't get fed. Are you going hungry today? Then maybe you need to sit down. Are you doing without? Maybe you need to sit down. Are you watching other people get fed while you don't get anything? Sit down. God has an order. He has a structure for his blessing, and you won't receive it until you submit to that order. Verse 11 says that everybody, all 20,000 people, ate as much as they would. Nobody was put on a diet. Nobody had to get the lunch portion. Who made that up anyways? Who decided we weren't as hungry at lunch as we are at supper? (laughs) Nobody had to sacrifice. Nobody had to do without. But everybody was completely filled. God doesn't do a half job. When God fills you up, he fills you up. Then Jesus instructed him in verse 12. He said, I want you to gather up the fragments that remain so nothing would be lost. He didn't throw anything out. He didn't put it in a dumpster or give it to the dogs. But Jesus said, get some baskets and pick up the leftovers. There is always someone else to feed. We are never going to be done with our ministry. We are never going to be finished. Of course we're going to ask for more and want to do more because we will never be done. There is always someone to be fed. And when the disciples had finished, they gathered 12 basketfuls of fragments left from the barley loaves eating is a mainstay in my family you're probably catching on when we get together as a family and it's my mom's fault i'm the way i am because of my mom because meal time in our home was a social time it was a happy time it was a time around that we we need to get the table back don't we we need to get the table back at home. You can, the clown's head at the drive-thru cannot do for you what the, what the table does in, at home. And it was a time of pleasure. It was a good time. So I've associated that with the meals. But when we get together, you know, we get together around the holidays. We get together at Christmas time. And my mom always made, you know, her light biscuits and turkey and dressing and homemade noodles and all of that. And we would eat until we just couldn't hardly eat anymore. And then at the end of the day, after all the presents had been opened, after the mess had been cleaned up, after everybody had eaten all morning and all afternoon, and it came time to go home, everybody was still concerned with who gets the leftovers. So when I read this, the first question that came to my mind was, who got the leftovers? There were 12 baskets full of stuff they picked up after this meal. I want to know who got the leftovers, and I think I figured it out. I think that at the end of the service, Jesus and the disciples ushered some little boy back to his house. He had gone to church by himself that day. I don't know why. Maybe, maybe mom and dad had to be working. Maybe they didn't have enough money to get by. Maybe they could only afford to send him. But they had raised him, right? Because he's the one that volunteered his lunch. And I think he probably got to the house and his mom said, Is that you? He said, Yeah, it's me. She says, How was church today? He said, Oh, it was good, mom. Did you come straight home? He said, yeah, I had to. (laughs) Did you eat all your lunch? Well, not really. Did you have anything left? Uh Uh-huh. Well, bring it in. I can see him going to the front door going, okay, guys. (laughs) Luke 638 says, give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. What a better description of that verse than than that right there. He said, Men will give unto your bosom for the same, with the same measure you measure with, it'll be measured to you again. What do you really do for the kingdom of God? What do you really do? You can be concerned, you can pray for people, you can say, Call me if you need it, but what are you actually doing? to make a difference in people's lives what do you have that's a luxury for you but it would be a necessity for somebody else what can you do for the kingdom of God 
Father, I pray to God at this time of invitation. Father, it will be a time of self-examination. God, we need to stop being just religious. We need to be active. There are things that need to be done in this world and a lot of people that are hurting and in need of help. And Lord, when it's not us, sometimes we just don't worry about it. But God, there are people that we can make a major difference in just by a small contribution on our part. Father, we can give our time, we can give our money, we can give our efforts. God, whatever it is, our talent, but God, we need to give it to you and apply it to the work of your kingdom to make a difference in our world to those that are hurting in need of our help. Those who have no man. Father, bless us today. In Jesus' name. Thank you for watching today's message from Free Christian Church of God in Continental Ohio. To find out more information about Free Christian Church of God or to receive a copy of Rev. James Fry's weekly television program, Your Life, call the church office at area code 419-596-3103 or visit our website at freecog.org and download your copy today.